Hello everyone, I'm Jim Karras. Welcome to this episode of the Hamburgers and Hot Rods podcast. The title of today's show is SoCal Classic Car Storage, Trends in the Hobby. Today, Dean Marash, the owner of SoCal Classic Car Storage, located in Laguna Hills, California, joins us to share about his business of offering automotive enthusiasts a safe and secure space to store their classic or exotic vehicles when they are in need of extra vehicle storage. Dean will also tell us about the podcast that he and his son Jason produce and publish each week, which is focused on bringing interesting and knowledgeable guests related to the automotive enthusiast world in every episode. The SoCal car scene has been received well by the Southern California car craze community, and Dean will provide some insight into the impetus for this unique show. Dean will give us some perspectives regarding his thoughts about the trends in the automotive enthusiast world here locally and across the hobby, and Dean will share a glimpse about emerging trends that he expects from his vantage point, which is unique and intuitive. Finally, we will learn about Dean's private car collection and hear about some of the gems he has brought home over the years. Please join us as we welcome Dean Marash to this episode of the Hamburgers and Hot Rods podcast. Welcome, Dean. It's sure a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Jim. It's our pleasure, really. We're just so excited you invited us. We can't wait. You know, what you offer to the car culture community here in Orange County is really I think a unique offering. I'm really excited to share this with our listeners. You know, there are other options, but I don't think anyone hits the mark quite as well as you and Jason are doing. You've really created something special. And I'm so excited to have you on and talk a little bit, not only about SoCal Classic Car Storage, but also the SoCal Car Podcast that you, the Car Scene Podcast that you do. So I hope we get to touch on a little bit of both of those. First of all, I guess I'd like to know What inspired you to actually start the classic car storage business that you have done so well? (laughs) Well, thank you for the fine compliment. That's very nice. Quite frankly, I've always, a couple of points in my career, my work career, I should say, I've made some hard right turns. My first life in work was in aerospace. I was an aeronautical engineering graduate and worked at Northrop for a number of years for 15 plus years, you know, when I exhausted that, I went into high tech and in high tech, I probably lasted a similar number of years, was in software and hardware, but all of it in marketing. And so I became a junior level marketing executive and enjoyed that run. Both high tech and airplanes were fascinating and invigorating, but everything seems to run its course and it had run its course. And and I had an opportunity with a a really good payout, if you will, to take some time and think. So I had some white space, you know, it was getting on in the years in my life. And I thought, you know, what do I want to do next? Do I want to get back on this wheel or do I want to become an entrepreneur? So the answer was entrepreneur. I took that payout, if you will, and built this business based on my passion. So this is really a passion business for me, Jim. I've been a car guy all my life. I was raised with you know, my father and brothers and sisters, all of us working on cars from an early age. And, you know, it's not like my dream was car storage, but, you know, I saw there was definitely a void in South OC. And I thought, you know what, this just seems to be right for me. I want to be an entrepreneur. Let's go do this. And here we are five years later, almost. So your background, as you said, you were, is it aerospace? So you're an engineer in aerospace. Is that what you, you did? Yes. All right. I, I spent 15 plus years at Northrop on a variety of programs, building airplanes, basically. So it was a great career, a lot of exciting platforms, you know, so that was great and really enjoyable. But, you know, like everything, it kind of runs its course. Some people are still there. Others have retired from that company and, never, you know, never left or stayed in aerospace. So also with the, uh, the aerospace, you, you have a marketing background as well. So, so I guess that lent into your entrepreneurial ability to be able to get the business launched and get the word out to everyone. That sounds like that helped serve you. Yeah, that's a great question or a great point, Jim. If I had a superpower, I'm not sure that I do, but let's say it's my best power, then it's marketing. And so I probably over-indexed on marketing when I started this business. I spent a lot of time crafting the brand, 
and thinking about what is SoCal Classic all about, what is this lifestyle that our customers have and want to continue to enjoy with their cars, and how do we make them feel right at home. So, you know, even since the inception, but even through now, I still spend a lot of time on marketing, and Jason is such a big help as well, helping us, you know, manage that brand and nurture it along and grow it as well. So really enjoy that part of the business. The rest of the things, I never carried a bag, wasn't a sales guy, I had to learn that. Operations did some, but needed to learn a lot of skills on the fly. So it's all true that you, you do what you're good at, and then you, you got to pick up the other things pretty quick. And I do think that you're really fortunate in having Jason work with you. Now, you started in 2015. Was Jason there from the very beginning, or did he come in after you got launched? No, he's only been with me for about two and a half years. And he spent his early career in multimedia, in radio, television, newspapers, and he did some podcasting as well. So he brings in some of the more, he brings in the fluency of these different marketing, uh, multimedia, capture, editing, and social media skill sets. So quite frankly, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn on the fly, but, you know, I'm limited based on my background. So it's a great combination of skills that we have together, but he brings a lot to the table. I think he's been a great compliment to you and you guys so, you know, really skilled at, at getting your word out. I'm really impressed with the podcast. We'll talk a little bit about that. But really, the question that I really have for you is, just the ability to be able to work with your son together in the business. And how is that? Is it really something that's just natural or is it challenging at times? Yeah. Is it junior and senior Tuttle building uh, motorcycles? You know, you've seen that one on TV. Right. It's not quite that bad, but there are moments, right? So, you know, overall it's a joy because for me personally, it's kind of, if you ever had a chance to coach your kids in sports, which I did, I coached Jason for a number of years in baseball and some basketball you know, you, you just feel like you're continuing to make investments in your children's future. And so every moment as a father, you really appreciate having that opportunity to continue to nurture, guide, see them grow, see them evolve. But, you know, there are moments, there are times when they'll ask a question like, are you asking that question as a father or as, the, uh, as my boss? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, once in a while we'll say, you know, that was a really good argument. We should get a producer down here and film this. I think we got a show here. So we don't throw stuff around and break doors like they do with the, like the Tuttles. But, you know, there are days when, you know, it can be frustrating. So just, you know what, you got to continue to stay the course and understand that it's challenging and there will be opportunities, you know, to be a little disgruntled. But those are minor and those are rare. I imagine you, you really do cherish the moments. Yeah, it's great. Oh, especially the successes, you know. We do. Um, I'm sure that's great. And, you know, the other thing about your business is you get to go out and go to different events in the community together. And I'm sure that you enjoy those times as well. Yeah, we do. A matter of fact, sometimes, you know, we'll split it up, right? I was at the quarantine cruise, the seventh quarantine cruise down in Huntington Beach a little over a week ago. And those have really exploded. Maybe we'll talk more about those later. So, you know, I'm down there shooting videos, meeting people, networking, saying hi. You know, of course, the car community gets pretty small once you've been in it for a while. So that was great. And then sometimes Jason will do a show on his own. And sometimes we'll do them together. But in the past, right, we'd do three or four car shows and be a vendor sponsor and have a booth, right, because we want to get back to the communities and have a presence at these shows. But this year has been a little bit odd and that Jay and, you know, myself and the rest of our team, we really haven't been going to any of those. And so it's a little odd to have a year where we didn't sponsor a booth at a car show. Yeah, I know. You know, everything's so different for everybody. I sure miss the social interactions that the car culture brings. It's, you know, it's really been a void. It's probably helped me in doing this endeavor of the podcast, but I'll tell you, I sure miss seeing everybody and seeing all the cars. Speaking of cars, you know, you've got a little mini car collection right out there behind you. Tell us a little bit about your clients and the cars that you store for folks. It's really quite an interesting collection. Um, share a little bit about the types of cars that, that you have as a customer base. Yeah, and it's ever evolving. So that's an interesting question because, you know, the one word that I use, if there is one word, is eclectic. You saw it. It's pretty eclectic. You know, you can easily find a Ferrari 488 GTB here or 
an older Ferrari. We've got a, we just had a 3.2 Mondial 1988, I believe, come in. But it's not just exotics, it's classics. We've got some incredible, like a 1956 Packard Caribbean convertible, one of 500. That's got air conditioning and power windows. Oh, that was a beautiful car, yeah. We've got a 1957 Bonneville convertible, power everything. You know, they only made about 600 of those. And we've got Packards, we've got Woodies, we've got Chip Foose cars. We've got every Corvette and Porsche, for whatever reason, ever built. It seems like, yeah, that's kind of an exaggeration. So they really run the gamut, and every day we're seeing something new. We, we just took in this 1956 Cameo that's blue and white, and it is absolutely perfect in every way. And the day before that, we took in a 1963 Ford Falcon to Tura, right? Like, who restores those? This car is factory fresh. So every day is a joy because it's putting you into the, either the Wayback Machine or putting you in close proximity to cars that maybe you've never seen or touched. So what, what a joy, right? What I found interesting is, yes, you do have such a wide variety of cars. And for you as the, the caretaker and custodian of these precious vehicles, you're among them every day. You get to enjoy them probably many more hours than their owners do. It's really a, quite a perk of the business, so I really am jealous. It was really fun to, <laughs> to, to be there, to see your facility. Uh, what you offer in car storage is head and shoulders above many other options that, that are out there in Southern California, specifically in Orange County. There's, there's no one that does it quite like you. You offer a whole set of amenities that really specifically cater to the classic car community, the car culture. Can you speak a little bit about the first class white glove service that you offer your clients? Yeah, thanks for asking that question because as our business has evolved, one of the things that you know I always comment or say is like, if, if our customers can imagine what their requirements are you know, to help them with their car, then odds are high that we probably do it. So some of the more obvious things that we do on site are hand car washes and details, right? And that's, you know, done on a by appointment or weekly basis. But other things that maybe uh, are less obvious, title, registration, transporting back and forth to repair facilities or to, you know, to dealers, to anything and everything in between pick up and drop off of cars. We've picked up and dropped off cars at the airport. So, there is no limit to what we will do to help our customers. Our, our perspective is we're here all day anyway. And so if we can exceed our customers' expectations on a, a, a recurring basis, then I think they're going to feel like they've got really good value. Our customers' time is precious. And, you know, they're probably, you know, maybe they're an entrepreneur themselves and running a business at seven days a week. They don't have time to go sit in the DMV for a half a day as one example. So we try to take that burden off their shoulders and make motoring um, a joy. So all they have to do is go out and enjoy the car. And then as I understood it, if one of the clients decide that they're going to attend a car show and let's say the load in is on Friday for the vehicles, like cruising for a cure, for example, they can give you a call and say, I'd like to pick up my car on Friday at 1 p.m. And when they arrive at your facility, tell us a little bit about what they can expect. Well, what they can expect is their, their car is going to be ready for them to pick up. Right in front of our lobby, car will be dusted off, the battery will be charged up, and really we just provide them the keys and they're off to enjoy it. No surprises. That's, our, uh, that's one of our mottos around here. You know, we don't like surprises for us or our customers. So they drop off their car or their guest, you know, maybe somebody drops them off here. But all they got to do is turn the key and go off and enjoy the motoring. And so, you know, it's really convenient for them. And we enjoy just catering to their needs that way. And then the same thing for the return, right? When they have a general window of the time, they're, they tell you they're going to bring the car back and you're there to receive the car and get it buttoned up for them. You, you do things like battery tenders and that sort of thing? Yeah, so all vehicles are battery tended here and no extra charge for that. We also... Keep an eye on tire pressure. If a customer wants us to have a car covered, for example, we do that. Uh, we, do, we pretty much follow a regime 
that the customer does in his own garage, let's say. Typically, our customers have run out of space. They've got five or six cars, and one or two of them are here. And so, you know, we basically try to be as particular as our customers are in their own garage. In many cases, we're more fussy than they are. But on the drop-off, same things. You know, they, they give us a notification. We take care of it. You know, we white glove that vehicle into the warehouse. And typically, if the car needs some attention like a wash or, you know, a wax or a detail service after it's been out and enjoyed for a while, our customers will notify us what they need. And uh, we take care of that right away. The thing I noticed was, one, everything was immaculate. Even cars that may not have been out, you know, for a week or two. It was very obvious to me in my visit to your facility that you were still maintaining the cars, dusting them, and keeping them really in ready-to-go condition. And that was impressive. They're stored in a climate-controlled environment. They weren't overly crowded. I got the sense that you really provided and approached every single customer's vehicle with respect, and that was neat to see. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, one thing about cars is there's always some story, you know. Now, granted, it could be that somebody's interested in purchasing vehicles because they look at them as investments. And in that instance, you know, they got to stay perfect, and they might have bought the perfect Porsche 930 slant nose, uh, 1989 air-cooled turbo. Very possible. But in a lot of cases, the story is much more personal. That might have been somebody's father's car, their grandfather's car. And so in that scenario, you know, the, the care and feeding of that car is just as important or more so. So we, we look at it from the perspective of really just having a real deep understanding of why these cars mean so much. It's the story behind every car, I think, that makes a huge difference for our, the owner. And, and we, we want to make sure that we can help them, you know, celebrate that story here. We really appreciate each and every car's particular journey, if you will. Do you find that some of your longstanding clients, you've been up this five years, that you participate in their life cycle as they buy and sell cars and, and you've, you know, on some second and third rounds of uh, clients having uh, new acquisitions? <laughs> That's a great question. Yes, is the answer. Uh, some of my clients are collectors and I haven't seen anything but the cars they started with or maybe they've grown the collection. Now, we've also sold a couple of cars for those collectors and they've downsized their collection. But we also have collectors that every couple of years, they've got three or four cars and they've had this one, you know, let's say for four years and they'll bring it to me and say, hey, you know, Dean, I tried to sell this at a car show for the last year, no luck, you know, and they'll say, hey, you know, we want to consign it with you. And they're shocked at how quickly and how much money we're able to get for it because it's like anything else, right? We're not, I wouldn't say we're doing anything in particular special, but this is an area of expertise for us, right? Whether it's the photography, whether it's the content, whether it's the advertising, whether it's our approach to handling prospects or leads, you know, all of that helps us move somebody along and get them into the next car. So a lot of our customers are, we're selling so they can go buy the next one, if that makes sense to you. Oh, it does. I think it's really remarkable. It's definitely the entrepreneurial spirit that you have in identifying the need for offering consignment services. How did that come about? And if I understand it right, you'll even do some acquisitions if they ask. But consigning cars for sale, talk a little bit about how you got into that sideline, I guess. Well, you know, it's like anything. When you create a business, you need to have, you know, my recommendation for anybody that's endeavoring to become an entrepreneur is that make sure your business has multiple streams of revenue. Sure. So this was yet another st revenue stream for us. Now, why that? Well, one, it's complementary to the business. Absolutely. Last thing I want is for a customer to say, hey, I want to sell, you know, one of my three cars that I'm storing with you. Do you know somebody that sells cars? And that, you know, that business just, if I say, yeah, it's Joe down the street, he's got a great shop and he's really good. You know, to me, that's business that it's a missed opportunity. But secondly, I've got a lot of experience selling cars. I've been buying and selling cars since I was a young man, high school, college, after college. This is how, you know, I raised money oftentimes and got through college and some other aspects of my life. So it's pretty, I don't know, it's, it's in my genetics, it's in my DNA, but I think there's a negative connotation about car sales and, you know, it's, it's from, you know, used car, the, the movie, sure. and Kurt Russell, right? And, you know, honestly, that's one perspective, but these are not your typical cars. These are 
great classics, they're exotics, they're incredible cars, sometimes they're built to the ninth. And so it's really a joy to play matchmaker on really awesome and historically significant cars. Jay sold a 47 Lincoln D12 convertible. And, you know, not the most desirable car, but historically significant. The V12 ran like a sewing machine, and the person that bought it was super happy. He also sold a 49 Pontiac that was restored to the nines, and uh, that person is now in Britain, and they've hauled their car all the way to Britain, and they've been doing car shows here. Oh, that's great. And there ever since. So we love to stay connected with the people we sell the cars to because we can continue to enjoy the journey with them. No, that seems like it's so complimentary. Yeah. And it's also important, you know, from a business standpoint, when we think about unplanned events like COVID-19, when you think about COVID-19, the one thing you need to be thinking about is, okay, how do I pivot? How do I reimagine my business? How do we uh, survive this? And so you better make sure you got three or four ways, uh, you know, making business in case some of those get shut down. Like we lost our event side of our business, right? So that used to be an integral part of what we do. So again, if you're over index, indexed on one thing and something outside your control goes, you know, takes it away, you better have some other ideas in mind, you know, so you can stay solvent, right? Right. No, you got to pay the bills. You got to pay the lease payment and all the electricity bills and everything. And right. one of the nice things about the car storage business is I imagine you don't have a huge amount of fluctuation in, in revenue as long as, you know, everyone isn't adversely affected in like a COVID-19 event. Yeah, honestly, it's a um, business that isn't as affected by COVID-19 as many. And we're very fortunate and very blessed because of that. And I think it has a lot to do with who our customers are. Our customers are oftentimes, you know, in an in a economic situation where they can afford extra cars. And these cars are part of their lifestyle. Maybe they made some sacrifices to have these cars. Could have had a bigger house, you know. Maybe could have been married, but <laughs> they chose five cars instead. And, you know, <laughs> yep. it's hilarious. I will say that many of my customers are entrepreneurs and they're successful businessmen. And so their ability to continue to make money during this challenging time doesn't seem to be as impeded as somebody who's working in a factory or at a restaurant, let's say, or you know, retail, for example. Those are just people in those situations have been devastated. So we have great compassion for that. But we've been pretty fortunate that many of my customers haven't been too affected by that. And then you started a podcast. Uh, Jason, I think, was part of the impetus for this, SoCal Car Scene. Tell us a little bit about how that came about, how it interacts with the car storage business, and really how fun it's been. Well, I'll answer the last question first. It's a, it's a great deal of fun. We enjoy that so much. You know, Jim, it's, it's a labor of love, right? We do it because we love it. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot, a lot more work than I imagined. And I couldn't have done it without my son because he brings in the film experience. He brings in the editing experience. I think your wife helps you, right? So she, right. she does editing, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yep. So you really have to have some help to go do this. It's hard to imagine doing this on your own. I'm sure some people might do it. Maybe Mark Green's able to pull it off. He's one of the few miracle workers in this podcasting business, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's been a true joy, and I'm grateful to have my son. And when, when I launched this idea, he was on board, so it was perfect timing. But we look at this as the insider's journey. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to peel back people's stories, you know, like kind of give people an insider's perspective. We had Wayne Carini on the show the other day, and it was great because Wayne told some stories about what really goes on in his life, in his, in his business, his success of his business, behind the scenes, funny stories where things go off the rails and things go sideways. So we really enjoy the exploration. It's really about exploring and the sharing with other people. So that's kind of how we look at it. But we're also delivering two or three other channels now. So we're doing a show that we call Car of the Week, and we're trying to do that every two to three weeks where we kind of do a, a short video expose on a car. We did one on a Knowles 442 W30, for example. So that's a lot of fun. Another show that we're doing, we just did one Friday, was a current car trends where we talk about what's going on in the car world. And then pretty soon we're going to do another channel, if you will, called The Car Insider. And The Car Insider is the story within the story. So it's kind of a, evolved into these multiple formats, podcast and these three other channels, if you will, 
to continue to create content, but make sure it's consistent with what we want to do. And hopefully people respond favorably, right? And so you never know, right? You just don't know. I think it's really awesome that you've invested the time. This is really something that will give back to the car community in so many ways. It's informative. The range of guests that you've had on your podcast is truly impressive. I am really in awe in the quality of guests, their their backgrounds. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, I guess you've got a lot of relationships in the community to leverage, but tell us a little bit about the range of guests you've had on the show. We've been very fortunate. We, you know, like anybody else, we get a lot of no's too. You know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when you talk about when you're a young man and, and dating and we you know, you get good at no. <laughs> so the first thing you need to do is, right. is be comfortable with people saying no. I just had one the other day when I reached out to somebody. But, you know, we've been very fortunate because each time we have a guest, then we have a bigger network. And sometimes that network will lead to connections with people maybe we've been wanting to get. So we had Andy Reid on, who's a judge for a lot of these Concord auctions, and he was fantastic. But his world's been rocked by COVID, not being able to judge. Then we've had the CEO of Gunter Works just recently, Peter Namon, to talk about these incredible $600,000 bespoke cars that they manufacture right down here in Huntington Beach. Yes. We've been fortunate to be on with Mark Green, and he's a serial podcaster. I don't know what other way to call him. He does one of these a day. I don't know how Mark does it. But what's great about Mark is like now I think of him as a friend and a mentor. I was on his show a long time ago. And Mark's probably one of the reasons why we do our podcast. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. If I had to give anybody credit, I'd say it's Mark Green. Yeah. And he's been super generous with his time. And, you know, we had Wade Kawasaki on recently who owns legendary companies and Coker Tires. And what a sweet guy. What a just a, a, a fantastic man. Today, we're going to have Doug and Marissa Campbell here from Superformance Hill Bank Motorsports. And we, we're just excited to find out what stories they've got. So we're like a kid in a candy store is the best way to describe it. We are out looking for all kinds of interesting angles because what's going on in the car world is incredible. It's expansive. Yes, yes. I know so little. Every time I'm like, we, we had a guy on uh, the president of the C10 Club. It was a great interview. And I'm like, the C10 Club, John Orr, what's the C10 Club? We opened that door up and I'm like, whoa, the response was massive. And I'm thinking to myself, I had no idea. But that's what's cool. You just got to keep opening doors and exploring. And it's, you know, really reveals a little child in all of us, at least for me personally. I don't know if you feel the same way, Jim. Oh, I absolutely do. I think part of it is just your personality and nature. You, you are very interested in people and their stories. That was, I think, an inspiration for you to approach the whole car storage business, you know, and you've carried it through. It comes across in your shows. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind. And it's been very enjoyable. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the current trends in the hobby. That's something that you are doing in your podcast. You're doing it, of course, in your business. Tell us a little bit from your perspective what you see on the horizon. You attend SEMA and, and kind of the things that are happening in the hobby short term and what you see over the next year, let's say. Okay. Yeah, so necessity continues to be the mother of invention. Car people will not be kept at home, in my perspective, witnessing this COVID-19 since March. You can close down their car meetup to cars and coffee, right? And you can limit them going to auctions, but they're so creative. I mentioned Andy Reid. Yes. And he created a Concours car show out of model cars digitally. So he runs this on Facebook and out of the ashes comes a car show, digital car show for models. And I'm thinking to myself, what a great idea. Everybody, there's always been kind of a limit to go to a Concorde Elegance, money, access, privilege. And now, <laughs> thanks to him, it, it's taken off. So things like that intrigue me. The quarantine car cruises here are just blown up where they have a meetup point, you get your directions on social media, you meet up, you drive down the coast or you drive across the city and then you meet at some undisclosed location. Car drive-ins are back. You know, car cruises are way big. So I think car people have to get together. And so that's what I've seen over the short term. And in the long term, I think some of these things have staying power. And Jason and I have talked about that on our podcast on Current Car Trends. Do you think it'll continue? I've also seen digital auctions now. So Monterey had a completely digital experience for a car week. Yes. 
Now, you know, granted, the volume was down by 50%. The sell-through rate is actually quite good on these digital auctions. So I think what their experience is higher sell-through rate, less price per vehicle, like in Car Week, it was like $350,000. They probably didn't push across as many $5 million cars. Sure. So I think in the future, I think we're going to get back to some sense of normalcy next year once COVID blows through. But will these big shows ever be what they were? I think they're going to be there, but I think they're going to be more of a hybrid. And maybe car shows of the future will be more of a drive-in and drive as part of the car show, for example, as opposed to just static, sit there, look at people's cars and do an off. You know, the thing about the quarantine cruise is the attraction to it was phenomenal. I don't know about the last one in Orange County, but I heard it was just an incredible turnout. Do you have a sense how many cars actually showed up for it? Well, I think the sixth one, they had about 2,000. Crazy. So this last one I was at, I'd say somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500. Wow. They started in Long Beach, they cruised the coast, and then they wound up in Huntington Beach. And so uh, the people that are coordinating that are very fluent in social media, right? They're really good at Instagram. They have a tremendous presence on YouTube. And so they use those tools to get the word out. And, you know, there's just no substitute for the influence people have on social media. So this is kind of a modern world of social media meets car shows and overcomes the, you know, the COVID-19 problems that we all face with traditional events. I'll tell you, to comment on that a little bit, I think that one of the things COVID-19 has done for our hobby is it's allowed us to embrace social media much quicker than we might have otherwise done so. Yeah, right. And I believe in the long run, my prediction is that will benefit the hobby in attracting younger people. You're already seeing it in the turnouts that are occurring. Yeah. It's the sons that are saying, hey, dad, do you want to go out on this? I saw this on uh, right. Instagram. You know, let's go. Let's get your car and go yep. where the dad may not have done it. But for the son wanting to help his father have some interaction, he becomes involved. And I've seen that over and over again. Right. I'm a member of many car clubs. And in the car club community, one of the things that you hear is there's two things. One is the judging or the car show crowd versus the touring crowd. The quarantine cruise phenomenon, and I've seen it on large and small scales across several clubs where they'll get together and go on a cruise together. Many of these people were typically folks that would just go to a car show and never participated in the tours. Yep. There has been a resurgence in many clubs, both nationally and locally, for car club touring now right. that I hope will withstand because, you know, that gets the cars out and gets them driven and really is, you know, kind of the whole thing about these vehicles is they're meant to be driven. Yeah, and I think it's kind of, a, you know, one of the craziest car events in the world, you know, to me is the great race and yes. legendary company owns the great race. And so Wade Kawasaki spent some time talking to us about that. People drive these courses for thousands of miles. And he said, Dean, you'd be surprised. These cars are from the twenties and thirties and some even in the teens. And some of those older cars will win, which is shocking to me. But I said, well, what happens when they break? He said, Dean, you wouldn't believe it. You know, overnight when the, the cruise or the stops at like a hotel or whatever, everybody helps. Everybody that's driving becomes a mechanic and everybody has extra parts. You know, everybody helps that person out. So he said the car community is always can't wait to help somebody else that has a breakdown. So I think that's one of our big fear factors. What happens? I've got a 49 Nash, for example, in my collection. And what happens if that thing breaks down? In that scenario, I think everybody's going to be there to help, which is so awesome. Oh, it's absolutely true. Two things on that. One is Vintage Chevrolet Club of America is one of the clubs I'm very active in. And, and uh, they have a father and son that have participated in the great race, I think, three or four years. No kidding. They're out of New York. They have a 1940 Chevrolet. And the two of them have done it together. And we got to go meet them here in Anaheim. I think it was three years ago that we did it. I remember. Yeah, I remember. But they've done it, and they really love it. And then on the Vintage Chevrolet tours, we've done many of those. I was on a tour up in Northern California. We had the Impala on that tour. And there was a 27 Chevy that was, you know, going along, and we were a few cars back. There was probably, I don't know, 30 cars, you know, together as a group. There were more on the tour, but this particular group. Yeah. And the 27 broke an axle. Ouch. Went over a bump, broke an axle, pulled over to the side. And so we got out and literally within about 10 minutes, three guys dug in their trunks and pulled out no way. axles no. for the 27. Three. And they had it back on the road in, I don't know, 40 minutes. 
And these were all, you know, 70, 80 year old guys out there, uh, got that <laughs> yeah. car running and continued the tour. That's the type of, uh, you know, culture that that's there. There isn't a question. Yeah. You know, and I, I think what it does is it takes me back to when we were young people and when our parents drove cars and people made long trips in cars. I mean, my cars were always old. When I was in high school, I had a 64 Ford and a 67 Cougar. And those things were breaking down every weekend or once a week, uh, whether I needed it or not. But we always had a bag of tools. We were always pretty self-sufficient, right? And even the family drove all cars. When we'd go up to Washington on a long trip, that was just the car experience. And so I think that the sooner we can involve young people in this, it's okay if something breaks, we can fix it. It'll be fun. It's an adventure. I think that's great. Let's not be afraid. I think what these new cars have done to us is made us insulated from how the cars work and how to fix them. And so we got to really get our young people involved. And, uh, and I think the, the cruising experience is a good way to do it, to your point. You know, the other thing that, that I've seen in the hobby, and I'm curious if you've given any thought to it, is electrification. How do you think that will translate, perhaps in future years, to the car collector's you know, realm and, and our hobby as more and more cars become electrified? Do you see some retrofitting of classic cars? And, and what do you think will happen with that technology and the collector world? I think it'll just continue to expand. We had Michael Brame on, the CEO of EV West down in San Diego, and his backlog is years long. And what do they do? Well, they sell a lot of kits and parts if you want to do it yourself. But they also take, you can take a Porsche to him and he'll electrify that Porsche. You can take a 1962 Corvair, which I have, which I'm tempted. I'd love to see that Corvair with an, you know, all electric. I've seen some guy online on Facebook do it. But I really think that there's a tremendous interest in this because guess what? You get to play mechanic. We've got a gentleman down here that works with us. His name is Eric Hansen, and he's built an electric car. And so let me tell you, it's a lot of fun. It might be even simpler than restoring a car and trying to resto mod it because it could be that they worked out all the bugs, these companies, and you, you can buy the kit and get busy. The kit, yes. It's incredible. I just, I just think it's going to get bigger and bigger. I don't know about you, Jim. I don't see any. Yeah. I don't see it slowing down. I, I don't think it's driven by the environment as much as people might think. I think that's part of it, but I think there's no substitute for immediate torque that they deliver. And so performance is a key factor in the electrification of vehicles. You know, at first, when it came on the scene, you know, with particularly Tesla, I actually thought it was a threat. I thought that, you know, as cars progress, that may be the end of the hobby. But then when I saw folks incorporating it and doing the retros and now with these kits and then became more aware of really the torque and the performance that Tesla has demonstrated, I have some experience in electric vehicles going back. Do you? Yeah, mostly rail-related stuff, so I have a limited understanding of the concepts of electricity, the torque, how the power is delivered from the motor to the wheels, the basic technology. Right. You know, so I have a little bit of understanding of it, but I didn't even envision, you know, Teslas, I'm using them, they're not the only ones, but they're a good example for the masses of, of people experiencing that torque and performance, and then they could, in their minds, translate it to their classic car. And now with these companies getting in, I do think it's an enhancement for the hobby and it'll just add another avenue for us. So I just hope that the regulators don't get in and, you know, once that becomes more mainstream and start coming after our gasoline and, you know, uh, cars, <laughs> Screw it up. which I've heard that. Yeah. Well, you know what? The ultimate bellwether could be these exotic car companies, uh, high performance supercars and hypercars. Jason and I talked about this the other day on our current car trends. McLaren's got a speed tail, just an incredible hybrid that goes 250 miles an hour, zero to 60 and two point, I don't know, five, 2.8. So what they're doing is making these incredible race cars that are street legal in limited quantity. And they're continue to push the envelope. Lamborghini's building one, you know, we got P1s, so it's not news, but there's gotta be a reason why these high end, almost bespoke car manufacturers are doing it. And I think it has a lot to do with performance gains, but I just don't see it going away. I don't know if it's going to be hybrids, all electric or some combination thereof, but uh, you know, it's a beautiful world of change. <laughs>
You know, as I mentioned earlier, you get to walk out and see a bunch of beautiful examples of cars. And I know you also have had cars your life. Tell us a little bit about your personal collection, some of the ones you wished you had that you'd sold or and then others you would aspire to have and kind of a little bit about your pride and joys over the years and what you aspire to obtain. Yeah, great question. You know, we talked about these different archetypes of customers, right, in our facility. Quite frankly, there's probably about 10 different buckets. I fall into the collector bucket. I buy and then I don't seem to sell. So that's my problem. (laughs) That's my disease. Mine too. But I've got a, uh, I mentioned the 49 Nash Air Flight two-door, very cool, uh, funky little car, very unique. I have a 1957 T-Bird white. That was my father's car. So again, that's got a great story. I have a 1955 Pontiac Safari wagon that was my mother's car. She drove that back and forth to work. So again, that car needs to be restored. The 57 and the 49 are driver qualities. I have a 67 Cougar XR7 Dan Gurney Special. That's at the paint shop. Well, may never get out of the paint shop. It's actually ready for paint. So hopefully someday soon. (laughs) I've got a 49 Town & Country Chrysler Convertible that is really in need of a major restoration. But what a car, what a story there uh, by Chrysler. Kind of the end of the era. Yes, yes. Kind of kind of the end, end of an era for the Woodies, right? Right about at that point. Right. You know, the Southern California Woodies uh, down Doheny, it's such an amazing show. Woodies are just a very interesting part of our history yep. in the evolution of design. And that's a treat always for me to go down and see that. Yep. Oh, yeah, I love that show. We've got a lot of our customers attend and are part- actively participating. But what's on the horizon for me? You know what? I'm in this mode of eclectic. I'm in this mode of, because I'm in the business I'm in, I really want something that's different. Maybe I haven't seen before or haven't seen much of. So I'm always on the hunt for some odd Studebaker. (laughs) You know, I love these Studebakers. The older, the better. A 1950 or a 1949 Studebaker with that funky grill appeals to be. Yes. Angly has appealed to me. So I'm in the, my mind, my heart's in the, 40s, I'd have to say, with some of these unique designs, like, you know, uh, speaking of uh, Nash, they had, then they, they had the Rambler, and the Ram- Rambler had, it was a convertible Nash, and the tops were rolled back on the side of the car. So, you know, that kind of stuff really appeals to me for some reason. And once you start seeing too much, you want something that you haven't seen before. Yeah, and I don't care if it's odd. My son gives me a hard time. Dad, some of your cars are just ugly, but maybe that's what makes them cool. I'm like, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> You know, I have a buddy, the co-founder of the All-American Original Show. He's into late 30s cars, early 40s cars. He likes that Art Deco, you know, yep. period. It's, it's So does Sabrina. That's her favorite period as well. And he has a really nice Super 8 Packard and a beautiful car. It's really nice. It's a 37. Wow. And But you know, what he ended up getting was a business coupe, a 37 Packard business coupe. And I think it's a three-speed, you know, floor shift, all original, unrestored car. I don't know. 30,000 miles, maybe. He likes low mileage cars. Wow. As beautiful as the Super 8 yeah. is, both of us really love that little coupe. One, you don't see them. No, you don't. And it's fun as heck to drive. The turning radius in it is amazing. And Packard got it right. And it just is such a cool car. So having something like that, you know, I'm into Chevys and there are plenty of Chevys. They're mass production cars. Right. But that's what I like. It's what I grew up with. But I'll tell you, I agree with you. Some of the unique cars out there that, that come. You know, I have to tell you, when you get a chance, bring the safari, bring whatever unrestored car you have to the All-American Original Show in Tustin. Okay, will do. You know, it'll give that car a chance to get some kudos that, you know, people in that crowd particularly love unrestored cars, and it doesn't matter. That Nash is unrestored. I had to rebuild the Flathead 6, though, and it's hard to find somebody can rebuild those old Flatheads. Yes, very rare skill set, apparently. Yes. But, you know, I don't know why I stuck with it. It was, well, I drop in a 350 or a, no, I'm not going to ruin that car. The, you know, that's a good way to ruin a classic. So I had the original motor rebuilt and, and the transmission rebuilt. But what a great car with a, a starter button underneath the clutch pedal. <laughs> yeah. At the last original show, I saw a 1915 Cadillac. Wow. Unrestored. Yeah. This car was weathered and beat. Sure. But it was all original. Everything was there, still running. And, you know, the guy was, I don't know, in his late 80s that that brought it. And he's had it, you know, 60 years or something. And it was so cool to see sitting next to, you know, some restored vehicles. And everybody was interested in that car. I mean, it just is fascinating at, at how the hobby offers so many, you know, little plums to your civic interests. You know, there's something for everybody. 
Well, to your point, we met a guy at a quarantine cruise uh, about a little over a week ago, and everybody was kind of migrating to his car, to his car, taking pictures. And I asked some people, hey, who is that guy? You know, and they said, hey, man, he's only about 18. I'm like, what? Wow. He's got this incredible 1969 Camaro, twin turbos, just some very unique design elements in the engine and the interior on the outside of the car. 69 Camaro is fairly common, but it just had something that nobody else had from a design standpoint. I, I shot a video of that car and put it on my Instagram page and, you know, quite frankly, it's blown up. Sure. And I'm like, but here's a young man. Granted, he, he might have gotten some help financially, but isn't it great to see young people having a vision and executing? on a vision that nobody else has but that's what's great about young people they're not constrained by what we've seen or what we think so i think that's why we got to continue to infuse the hobby with young fresh minds and you can get a different take on stuff that's fairly common and it'll blow your mind any glimpses you can give us about some future guests on your podcast a oh, great question. Well, we're really, we've got a long list of people. And, you know, we, we don't just want people that are, you know, in the TV scene or are famous. We've got a gentleman lined up. His name is uh, Jason Scudelaria. And if I mispronounce his, mispronounce his name, I apologize. He, he does Week to Wicked. Uh, he does car show. But he's been down here a couple of times. And he is, uh, he's an example of young people building cars with high performance LS, LSX motors and getting, you know, damn near a thousand horsepower out of cars wow but having some very he did this 1963 nova we had down here for a photo op and it, there's so much subtlety in his builds on whether it's the exhaust or the interior or how he you know modified the drivetrain you look at that car and the closer you get the more you see Oh, I, I can't wait to see that. I had a 63 Nova Supersport. Oh, you had one? When I was a kid. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Well, there's a video out there on our Instagram page of uh, him on SoCal Classic, at SoCal Classic. And uh, so we want more people like that that are pushing the envelope. Not that Jason's on TV. We're more interested in his build and his style. So we don't want just builders. We want to get some of these manufacturers on, you know, big ones that are supporting Chevys. You know, we've had a number of companies on and all they do is make parts and parts making is fascinating, right? Yes. Incredible. For Chevys. I mean, oh my God, think of the suppliers for guys that are building Chevys just by themselves, you know? You know, in the vintage Chevrolet club, there are guys that do a lot of small run unique parts and then they end up getting such a demand. Uh, the filling station up in Oregon has a whole army of, I'll call them boutique suppliers that make specific parts for these earlier cars. Right. And it's incredible, the detail of work. And, you know, my hat's off to all those guys. They're filling the need that. Incredible. Yeah. You know, it's really neat. Incredible. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Yes. Wayne Carini goes on to tell the story about what he did with his father. Him and his dad would go out on the weekend. I guess his dad owned, uh, I think, a gas station or something like that. But he, he was doing a repair shop at the time. But on the weekend, they would drive the countryside. I think what he told the wife is that they were going to go fishing something like that. <laughs> so the idea was Wayne was responsible for the houses on the right. His dad was responsible for the houses on the left. And what they were doing was trying to see a Model A or a Model T car or some indication that there were cars that were abandoned. Somebody was into the car scene. They'd go knock on their door and go buy parts. So nobody was making Model A, Model T parts at the time. And so basically he was supplying uh, repair shops and maybe, I don't even know if it was Ford, but isn't that fascinating? His father made a business working with his son, just driving the countryside and then buying from people that had no use for this stuff and then reselling it to people that were supplying it. Wow. What a great story. What a great lesson as a child. Incredible. And again, bringing it back to you, they have a passion and they figured out how to be entrepreneurial and monetize it and do what they love to do. I really am envious of all those guys. I know it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Sure. Uh, it's not easy. You know, just running any business is a challenge. But tell us how folks can get in touch with you. Give us some idea about contact and website and just how they can connect with you if they have an interest either in the classic car storage or to subscribe to your podcast distribution channels. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So they can reach out to us on our website, SoCalClassicCarStorage.com. They can find a lot of our media content on that same page, you know, SoCalCarStorage.com forward slash media. But we're out there quite a bit on Instagram as well. You know, we've got pages for both at SoCal Classic and SoCal Car Scene for the podcast and all the other video content. And then we're out there on YouTube as well with these videos that we've been creating, whether they're the podcast or whether they're these shows that we talked about, those are out there as well. So that's on the SoCal Car Scene, separate words, you'll find us out there. And there, you know, there's a lot of, we've got a lot of content out there, so it's a lot of fun. So people can reach out to those, any of those sites. And the other way to do it is, of course, call us on our, our main phone, 949-305-4818, anytime. We always pick up the phone. And so there's lots of ways to get in touch with us. That's fantastic. I sure appreciate it. Any final comments for us, what you'd like to share about uh, anything at all? No, I just appreciate you reaching out to uh, us, Jim. We're excited to be on your show. Love what you've done. You've really done a great job of just sharing the history of cars and the connection with food and how it's such a unique culture. I don't know what other word to, to describe it, but this car community has roots that go back, you know, probably over 100 years. And But you're keeping that alive, the culture. It's important to understand the history, uh, why we do what we do and why we hang out where we hang out. And we behave the way we do. But, you know, I, I just want to say thank you for doing all that you've done to keep us plugged in, if you will. Well, I sure appreciate it. Thanks so much for what you do, not only in providing a safe haven for classic cars when a guy runs out of garage space, <laughs> but also keeping us informed about the trends and kind of the upcoming ideas and events in the hobby through your podcast and other social media content that you're putting out. You guys do a wonderful job. Uh, give our best to Jason. Will do. I know that he's he's out. Earning money. Yes, earning money in his full-time gig, and so we appreciate that. Hopefully. Thanks so much. I'll put your contact information in the show notes as we publish. Thank you. So, again, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, Jim. In our next episode, we welcome John Simmons, the owner of Jazz Rosin Customs, to talk about the trends in the hot rod scene today. John will share about his hot rod and customs repair and restoration shop, and he will tell us about some of the awesome cars and truck builds his crew performs for his clients. Jim and John will discuss how COVID-19 has affected his business and how he and his crew have navigated through these challenging times. Some of the topics we will learn about will include John's thoughts on the future trends in both the hot rod and classic car hobby, including how the car show scene and the cruising scene will look going forward. In addition to telling us about his clients' cars, John will share about his personal special cars, both current and his plans for new additions to his car stable in the future. Please join us as we feature Jazz Rods and Customs on the next episode of the Hamburgers and Hot Rods podcast. Please join me in thanking Dean Barash of SoCal Classic Car Storage and the SoCal Car Scene for spending time with us today to share his insightful perspectives on our hobby. Dean brings a wealth of knowledge to each endeavor he undertakes, and it was a real treat to listen to his thoughts about the automotive world. That's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed your time with us today. You can visit us online at hamburgersandhotrods.com. There, you can check out our show notes, listen to our complete show library, or watch the YouTube video versions of each of our shows. You can also check out all of the various podcast platforms where our show can be heard. Until next time, thanks for listening. We'll see you then.